My first steps into the Shadow Realm are with bare feet and an empty head. After reaching out to Mog's crusty egg, I materialize in a vast, rolling field dotted with ruins. In the distance is a dimmed, sickly twin of the Erd Tree ringed by shadowy drapes. It takes a while to get a rhythm going again and sort out whatever I was trying to do with my New Game Plus build, but I decide for the sake of efficiency to stick to my Moonvale slash Carrion Glintstone staff setup, because one does not simply walk into a FromSoft DLC. It takes even more time to feel at home again, but soon I'm puncturing hearts and obliterating minds, executing small huddles of gibbering NPCs as they pray, finding ways to slip past hard-hitting nights. Everyone I meet is all about Mikola, and it's a lot, but such is the way of the cult. Mikola has left crosses scattered about the Shadow Realm for his devotees, to denote where he has shed parts of himself and his flesh. We are back. Until we aren't. It's been almost two years since I last touched Elden Ring, which I loved when it came out in early 2022. With so much of the game dissected, analysed and overanalyzed by players and critics since its release, going into this DLC is a very different and necessarily loaded experience. With Elden Ring, we all went in blind as newborn kittens and learned to read the land slowly and surely until it became familiar. Shadow of the Erd Tree is framed around a much more explicit mission, to find Mikla, or at least, figure out what happened to him after Mog snatched him. The Shadow Realm itself offers variations on the same aesthetic themes of Elden Ring, expansive plains, dense clumps of forest, hulking fortresses and, of course, pockets of everyone's favourite poison swamps. There are five main regions, each with their own small terrors, but it's all signature from soft design terrain that demands careful scrutiny for hidden paths and other secrets. Despite entering this world to discern Mikla's fate, I am, like in the core base game, technically free to run around wherever I can. I can choose to focus on the big legacy dungeon in the starting area, in the castle light settlement of Velarat, and the slow process of learning where and when to slash and run and duck. As I explore more of the map, I realise that there's a strange sense of emptiness, or at least, irregular organisation and grouping of lore-relevant areas of mobs that pervades the Shadow Realm. There's certainly a lot of new terrain to cover, but many portions of the map feel like too dead space, in ways that the core game, mostly, mitigated through novelty and, to a lesser extent, more varied encounters like Everjails. The DLC has two new items, Scattered Tree Fragments and Revered Spirit Ashes, to bolster my tarnish, but they're only effective in the Shadow Realm, and to this end, there is no real need to go back to Round Table Hold, unless you want to beef up the handful of new DLC Spirit Ashes or upgrade weapons. Collecting Scadu Tree Fragments offers a substantial boost to both my damage output and damage negation, and Revered Spirit Ashes does the equivalent for my Spirit Ashes. It becomes clear after my early jaunts around Gravesite Plain that I was gonna need them, Despite my substantial health bar, the first few hours felt like I was unnaked and afraid whenever I met a new type of enemy, or made small but costly misjudgments. Besides these new items, and a new martial arts and combat style courtesy of fellow Mikola enthusiast, Dryleaf Dane, combat and mechanics are mostly business as usual. The first three major bosses are challenging, but readable and learnable. The difficulty discrepancy between those and the fourth boss, though, was brutal. So far, so souls. Throughout the open world, there are also gargantuan new enemies. Furnace golems, which I didn't mess with too much, because across this DLC there was simply so much to do. What I did learn is these are enormous basket-headed machina that only take damage at precise points, they can also spot you from miles away and start spewing dinosaur-ending amounts of fireballs. Unfair bastards, but totally avoidable if you don't mind missing out on new mixtures for the wondrous physic. The best way to deal with furnace golems is to hurl hefty pots into their basket receptacles, but frankly, I did not have time to commit to that. 
My priority here was seeing as much of Shadow of the Earth Tree as I could, and so to this end, I mostly stuck with variations of what I knew. In an ideal world, perhaps I could have found some wildly experimental build to mess around with and actually have little fun, but as an astrologer rocking an index build, there aren't many good upgrades for me in the early game. At least, nothing that can beat what I already had, especially my faithful Mimic tier. One of my biggest issues with this DLC is how it explicitly abandons the core appeal of Elden Ring as a living text to be read and learned, and ambiently, lovingly communicated across realms through vague multiplayer messages. The actual lore, the stuff behind the Elden Lord, Marika, the Fingers at Al, is not too hard to understand. What I'm talking about is the way players perceive and experience the world, and how they move through it using an evolving body of hard-won knowledge, including the knowledge that others are failing but persisting, which defines a fundamental aspect of Elden Ring's gameplay. It's really hard to maintain that sense of growth and tension when the DLC undermines the hallmarks of its own genre through unnecessary signposting. And, to an extent, the unavoidable linearity of a DLC that revolves around one clear premise. So, for some examples, at one point I enter a dungeon with an official message at the entrance, explicitly telling me to hit them where they're weakest, referring to the dungeon's golem-like constructs. This is not a directive anyone wants to see in a FromSoft game. It's difficult to imagine someone making it this far into a Souls game and not understanding the point of a conspicuously red gaping hole in a large monster. The worst is out at the Abyssal Woods, which takes some of the most obnoxious pages out of Bloodborne's book. It's a stealth-focused region that announces its gimmick via multiple official messages, that spell things out to the player as one would a child. One would think that FromSoft would let me learn through my own suffering, but apparently not. Do not let it see you, reads one message, so I immediately put on my silencing talisman so I can creep around comfortably. Another message, it cannot even be touched, implies that I shouldn't even try? A huge part of Souls games is intuiting and adapting and deciphering other players' cryptic warnings, not reading a clear instruction and avoiding the lesson entirely. The result of all this signposting is that the Abyssal Woods early warning setup essentially defangs itself in a way that feels totally counterintuitive to the spirit of the game. Compounding the issue is how the creatures of the Abyssal Woods themselves are also a thinly reheated Bloodborne concept, and so, altogether, the entire area ends up feeling like an empty disappointment. Like any Souls-like, there are times where I have to walk away from a boss fight before I get shamefully tilted. This has never been more true than for the final boss in Shadow of the Erd Tree, which I make 49 miserable attempts to kill, before realising I have to set it aside for now. That FromSoft designs these encounters as a display of hardness and unforgiving brutality in its flagship genre is not surprising, but there is a point at which this becomes one-dimensional and as such pointlessly maddening, especially if this is the final boss encounter. If we wish to follow Mikla's example of shedding the old ways and rejecting tradition, a more meaningful approach might be to rethink how this sort of impassibility could work. It's true that this distinct type of FromSoft engineered frustration is an indispensable part of the Souls experience, to hurl yourself repeatedly against a seemingly immovable object until through sheer luck and serendipitous timing, you somehow prevail. There is real palpable joy and pride and relief in that. We've all felt it, and, with the blessing of hindsight, suddenly, all of that failure feels like it was worth it. In other cases, they're genuinely instructional, with real lessons learned. This, however, feels like difficulty for difficulty's sake turned up to 11, perhaps because with the added expectations of a DLC having something extra absurd to conquer, even though it technically doesn't require finishing the core game. I go through dozens of deaths over a period of several days, and despite taking breaks to go off and do other things and explore other areas, I realise that I just don't want to do this anymore. In the Shadow Realm, death is always listening. 
I surf fleeting wavelets of euphoria as I dodge and roll away from ambushes or groan in exasperation as I get sniped from a thousand miles away by a guy with a Radan-sized chip on his bow shoulder. I become fascinated with a lone helmet dangling off a stick. Beneath the waterfall is a bit of environmental storytelling, and I return repeatedly to the Cerulean coast just because I think it's pretty. I'm seriously thinking about respecking my tarnish to a faith-focused build so I can play around with some of the new dragon incantations which look genuinely cool. I am still impossibly fond of Elden Ring and my time spent in its grasp, but I'm just not sure if I can share the same fullness of warmth with Shadow of the Erd Tree. Despite its strange dispersion of active areas and uncharacterizingly infantilizing handholding for encounters that should be learned through repeated failure, Shadow of the Erd Tree still has its share of Elden Ring's brilliance weird little dudes and obscure secrets and goofy cheesing and all. But perhaps trying to combine the inherent focus of a largely self-contained DLC with the narrative flexibility and open world freedom of Elden Ring, the concept that set it apart from its soul's brethren, was always going to make for an incongruous match. Shadow of the Erd Tree was reviewed by Alexis Ong and narrated by yours truly, Zoe Delahunty Light. If you want to read this review in more detail, you can find its full version at Eurogamer.net. I'll see you folks next time.